This is Hubwonk. I'm Joe Salvaggi. Welcome to Hubwonk, a podcast of Pioneer Institute, a think tank in Boston. In November, the U.S. Supreme Court will hear oral arguments in the case of USA v. Rahimi. The defendant, Mr. Rahimi, is challenging a federal law that prohibits those with domestic abuse restraining orders from owning a firearm. Though the defendant has committed gun-related crimes in his past, it was in fact an uncontested civil restraining order that ultimately caused Mr. Rahimi's legal forfeiture of his right to own a firearm. While the court will certainly weigh the rights and concerns of domestic abuse victims, the nine justices will need to grapple with balancing the protection of abuse victims with the obligation to provide all defendants with due process and appropriate penalties. How can the court find legal precedents for domestic abuse prosecution from case laws that have seldom recognized such crimes? And if the courts hold that armed self-defense is a fundamental right, what are the implied thresholds for crime severity and due process when taking such a right? My guest today is Clark Neely, Senior Vice President for Legal Studies at the Cato Institute, Adjunct Professor of George Mason's Antonin Scalia School of Law, and past co-counsel in the U.S. Supreme Court case, District of Columbia v. Heller. Attorney Neely will discuss the facts and issues the court will consider in the USA v. Rahimi case and share with us his views on whether the current federal laws restricting firearm ownership for those accused of domestic violence will pass constitutional muster. We will discuss how the court's demonstrated recognition of the fundamental right to keep and bear arms will affect the writing and enforcement of gun ownership laws in the future. When I return, I'll be joined by legal scholar, attorney Clark Neely. Okay, we're back. This is Hubwonk. I'm Joe Salvaggi, and I'm now pleased to be joined by adjunct professor at George Mason Antonin Scalia School of Law, Clark Neely. Welcome to Hubwonk, Clark. Great to be with you. Thanks. All right, we're going to be talking about a, a Supreme Court case uh, that's upcoming. The oral arguments are, are, are in our future. Uh, the case is USA v. Rahimi. Um, and we're talking about uh, Second Amendment and uh, our constitutional right to bear arms. Uh, what the limits are, if those uh, rights are to be taken away, what the what the procedures and process are for those. So it's a, I think it's a, a very interesting case because it bumps up against a lot of absolutist views, which are a lot of people think we have an absolute right to bear arms. Others say we have an absolute right to safety. Uh, and this case, I think, explores the contours of both those arguments and see if there's some way to reconcile those that, that conflict. So let's start at the beginning. We're going to be talking about Second Amendment. But before we go in there, we're not all law professors or law uh, scholars, legal scholars on this podcast. Let's start with the beginning. What does the Second Amendment uh, say? And, you know, let's uh, also in there... Uh, uh, Feature some of the more recent Supreme Court cases, specifically Heller. How, how does the Supreme, uh, how does the Second Amendment guarantee our right to bear arms, and what has the Supreme Court said recently? Right. So the Second Amendment reads uh, as follows: um, A well-regulated militia, being necessary to the security of a free state, comma, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, shall not be infringed. Uh, and for over 200 years, we never got a definitive interpretation from the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, and during that time, there emerged essentially two perspectives on the meaning of the Second Amendment. One is that it protects some kind of a collective right or a state's right to arm their militias. Uh, that, that's not really a right that belongs to or could be enforced by an individual. Uh, and then the other school of thought that emerged is that it's, uh, an, it protects an individual right like virtually all of the rest of the Bill of Rights. Um, and that uh, under the Second Amendment, an individual has a right of some scope, all rights are limited, and so, would, so is the Second Amendment, uh, to uh, own a gun. And so in 2008, in the Heller case, that's the case that I and two of my co-counsel helped bring to the Supreme Court, um, the Supreme Court, for the first time, took a definitive position on the meaning of the Second Amendment and embraced the so-called individual rights interpretation. So uh, we sort of, in those two camps, we dispense with the right to the militia, which is, uh, to me, it seems like a curious assertion whereby you have a fundamental right, but it's regulated by the state. So it's really not a fundamental right. If the militia is informed, you have no right. So um, uh, that doesn't seem to be intellectually consistent. But um, Heller determined it was an individual right. And then uh, going a little, that was about 15 years ago, you were the uh, co-counsel there. Uh, and then as recently as two years ago, uh, we often hear this word right right to uh, keep and bear arms, which is to actually use that right to, to hold an, a weapon, you bear it. Uh, the recent Bruin case uh, uh, cast some color on this debate. What, what did the Bruin, say, Bruin case say? Right. So 
all that the Heller case from 2008 held was that there is an individual right to own a gun at home for self-defense. That leaves open a, a large number of other questions, including whether the Second Amendment, or more precisely, the right uh, to keep and bear arms, uh, because it's protected both by the Second Amendment and the 14th Amendment, depending on whether it's a state or a federal uh, law. But putting that aside, the question is whether uh, you have a right to uh, carry a gun outside the home. Uh, and lower courts disagreed with that about uh, among each other about that after, in the wake of Heller. Uh, and so just last year, the Supreme Court took up a case uh, out of New York, which is one of a small handful of states that um, when it comes to permitting people, um, issuing permits to carry a gun outside the home, instead of a purely objective approach like we take with a driver's license, where if you meet certain requirements, they have to give you the license, New York, California, Massachusetts, and a handful of other states had what's called a discretionary permitting system, where you actually have to go further and persuade some local official, could be a judge, could be a police chief or somebody else, that you in particular have a special need to carry a gun outside the home. And unsurprisingly, the Supreme Court struck that down because there really is no history. And, and, and even at present, there's just no um, other constitutional right where you only get to exercise it if you can show that you really need to, or if you can persuade the government uh, that you have uh, some special prerogative. And so uh, the Supreme Court in the Bruin case last year struck down New York's discretionary permitting system and basically held two things. First, there is a constitutional right to carry arms outside the home. And second, uh, while the state can require a permit to do so, that permit has to be issued on the basis of objective criteria and not subjective ones, the way that New York and California were doing. So the government can't decide which rights it wants to allow you to to use so uh, that that's interesting. So I I, I just want to you know uh, get a little more abstract before we go deep into the Rahimi case and uh, and acknowledge that I'm sure for a lot of our listeners uh, they're divided by the, this view of gun ownership, this right enshrined in the Constitution as being some so, somewhat anachronistic. Perhaps the right to bear arms may have been important in the 18th century, uh, but now it's uh, you know completely outdated. Uh, similarly, again, we're, we're, I'm t uh, talking with you from uh, the middle of Boston, uh, perhaps in the wide expanses of this great country where, you know, the police may be an hour away. Uh, you know, obviously, you can't imagine living life without the means to protect yourself. So this is deeply divisive. It, from your view as a legal scholar, do you think people's opinion about the, the prudential wisdom of owning and or permitting ordinary citizens to carry a gun, does that influence scholars and those people who, who who wrestle with this issue so much that it almost makes it impossible to have a, a clean, objective debate? I think it does uh, influence people to some extent, but um, it's really, I think we have to be careful not to suppose that there's anything new about this. I'll give you one example. Um, when the Supreme Court held uh, uh, in the Miranda case that you have a right to be advised uh, about your rights and a right to remain silent and a right to uh, request a lawyer. Um, there was a tremendous upcry, uh, uh, outcry about that, uh, including uh, from, you know, police and the pro-law enforcement community. And essentially, people were like, oh, you know, we're going to be, um, uh, you know, failing to prosecute or, or allowing to escape conviction of uh, people who have committed really serious crimes. Um, now, maybe that's happened. We don't know, I think, really for sure. Uh, but the question is, does the Constitution properly understood require this or does it not? An even more stark example would be the fact that police used to routinely beat confessions out of suspects um, in many southern states, in Chicago and other big cities, uh, to a fairly high degree of certainty that enabled them to, to identify some criminals and to solve some crimes that they would not otherwise have been able to solve. I mean, if you know where the bloody knife is or the body that's buried somewhere, you probably had something to do with it. Um, so we are, I think, as a country, uh, hopefully all of us used to the idea that we was, we restrict the government in certain ways that, that could lead to bad outcomes. Maybe we have released a murderer before who we otherwise could have kept locked up um, uh, because of the application of, of some rule of criminal procedure that's in the Bill of Rights. I, I see the Second Amendment in very much the same way, and I would say two things about it. First of all, there is a fundamental natural right 
of self-defense that we all possess. And guess what? It is nowhere mentioned in the text of the Constitution. But when it comes up, when somebody, for example, um, argues that they acted in self-defense and they want to be able to argue that to a jury in a homicide prosecution, guess what? They get to do that as long as the evidence supports it because we have a fundamental right of self-defense. It has even come up in the context of uh, people who've been attacked, for example, or who claim they've been attacked by a wild animal, um, a bear, a mountain lion, or a domestic animal like a dog, and they have shot it unlawfully, and then they'll argue, well, listen, I had a right to defend myself, and guess what the courts say? Yeah, you do. So I actually don't even think we need a Second Amendment to protect the right to own a gun, because um, the, the, the fundamental right of self-defense implies, and I would say strongly implies, a fundamental right of effective self-defense, which means you have a right to pick up a weapon. Can you imagine defending yourself against a bear, by the way, with something other than a firearm? That's preposterous. Uh, so I'm very comfortable with the idea that there is a natural right of effective self-defense, and all the Second Amendment really does is acknowledge uh, that there's that that right entails a right uh, to be armed, uh, but I think that's really in some ways sort of an afterthought. That is inherent, every bit as much as inherent um, as your right of free speech or your right to worship as you please. Those are not dependent on the existence of the First Amendment. They are mentioned in the First Amendment, uh, but for two years after the ratification of the Constitution in 1789, we didn't have a Bill of Rights. Guess what? You still had a right of free speech. You still had a right to worship as you please, and you still had a right of effective self-defense before the Bill of Rights went into effect. And to, to tie the, the, the two remarks you made in, in there, which is you, I think we're asserting that your right to due process with your b being Mirandized is essential. Essentially, it was codified with Miranda, but essentially nobody believes or, or that you should be locked up without being, you know, you know apprised of your, your rights as an individual, right? You, you, we believe in process as much as, you know, end results. In fact, more than that, if a few bad guys get away because they weren't properly um, treated by the law, then, you know, we're okay with that because, fundamentally, you can't, you know, abrogate your right to, to due process, right? Yeah, that's right. And, and it's more than just a right of due process. I mean, I don't want to be pedantic, but it actually says in the Sixth Amendment that you have a right to be informed of the charges against you. Um, now, Miranda was a stretch from there. It was another step forward saying you have a right to be informed of your rights. But this is not unusual. The, the Constitution um, is a, a very short and concise document. Um, in some places, it is very specific, like that you have to be at least 35 years old to be president. In other places, it's more open-ended, where it says, for example, that nobody can be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, but then doesn't spell out exactly what that means. And so some of these rights that the Supreme Court has interpreted, like the right to be advised of your right to remain silent, which is, of course, a Fifth Amendment right, um, is um, you know, essentially the Supreme Court trying to, to work out, okay, how should we go about applying um, and making these rights actually effective in the real world? And there would be, according you know, the Supreme Court's view is essentially that there wouldn't be much point in having a Fifth Amendment right not to incriminate yourself if the government didn't advise you of that when they start asking you incriminating questions. I think that's pretty sound reasoning. Indeed. And this is just, you know, I'm enjoying the conversation. And, uh, you know, again, our, our audience probably knows that the Bill of Rights was a compromise between the Federalists and Anti-Federalists. And in a sense, you know, uh, the, the Federalists thought it was redundant. You know, of course, we didn't need these rights. Uh, you know, it's it implied. But of course, there was uh, an assurance. OK, we shouldn't do these things. But just in case, let's write it down. Uh, but again, you know, we could we could have a wonderful conversation about this. I want to focus on our our topic, which is Rahimi, and this isn't just a um, uh, superfluous um, intellectual uh, debate here. Rahimi is very heavily relies on process or what is required of uh, due process. Um, but let's start at the beginning. Uh, the uh, plaintiff is a, or is he the defendant? Um, uh, hey. Yeah. Um, he's not a very good character. He's an unsavory character, but uh, so let's get the facts in the case. Mr. Rahimi, what, what, who is he and what has he done? Yeah, so Zeki Rahimi is a um, resident of North Texas, uh, near where I went to high school. I went to high school at Plano, Texas. Um, and um, this guy Rahimi um, is alleged. Now it's important to be clear. Um, most of, of the facts that we think uh, we know about him are still just allegations, but let's be clear, they seem pretty plausible, um, that he's engaged in a number of violent acts uh, with a gun, including shooting at another motorist after a traffic accident, um, shooting at a, a drive through window when the restaurant declined his friend's credit card, um, and uh, threatening um, a, a former girlfriend. 
uh, which is ultimately uh, sort of what set in, in motion the chain of events that led to his prosecution for unlawfully possessing firearms while being subject to a domestic violence protection order. But the bottom line is he certainly does appear to be a rather unsavory character um, who I think most people, myself included, would not think should be out there uh, running around with a gun and perhaps not running around at all. It may well be that he should be incarcerated for some period of time. But as you and I discussed just a moment ago, it matters tremendously how the government goes about effectuating a policy like um, disarming uh, people who are believed to have engaged in domestic violence. So um, he was engaged in uh, domestic violence. Before we talk about how that, which law uh, uh, sort of, sort of uh, disempowered uh, Mr. Rahimi or it took away his right to uh, bear arms, uh, how does what what is the procedure for you know give us an example of, besides guns when can the the state take away of course your liberty if you, you you commit a crime you wind up in jail you can't go anywhere what are some of the other examples of a uh, where the state can take away a fundamental uh, constitutional right it's extremely limited um, and uh, one example would be um, and just an illustration of how seriously the courts take uh, people's fundamental rights. Um, sometimes you'll have, for example, somebody who's been <clears throat> convicted of, um, of of child pornography or some kind of a sex crime um, involving children, which is, of course, one of the most horrific acts that a person can commit. Uh, and sometimes the government will ask, uh, because of that person's past conduct, that they be uh, ordered to no longer access the internet, maybe because they've been, you know, trading images or something like that. Um, that's not something that's just done routinely. Every time somebody gets caught, for example, with child pornography on their computer, there is a very high standard that the government has to meet in order to um, get a court order saying somebody no longer has access uh, to the internet. Another example would be the termination of parental rights when the state steps in and says that you don't have custody of your children anymore. Perhaps even you don't get to uh, visit with your children, particularly unsupervised. Um, as we mentioned in the amicus brief that we filed in the Rahimi case, the Supreme Court has stated that the, that to in order to to terminate somebody's parental rights, there has to be a, a demonstration by clear and convincing evidence, which is higher than a preponderance and a little bit lower than beyond reasonable doubt. Um, the government has to prove by clear and convincing evidence that whatever the statutory elements are to to, to terminate a parental relationship uh, have been met. So. Um, the short answer is that um, the courts and are extremely reluctant uh, to, in effect, allow the government to rescind or even to temporarily suspend somebody's ability to exercise a fundamental constitutional right. Um, and that's exactly what's at issue in this Rahimi case, because there's a federal law, 18 U.S.C. 922 G8, uh, that provides that anybody who is the subject of a domestic violence restraining order um, is not permitted to own firearms, and it is a very serious federal felony for anyone to continue to possess firearms while they are subject to such an order. So I think you, you anticipated my next question. I said, we've already established the fundamental right to bear arms that's been, you know, it's written in the Constitution and, and supported by recent uh, uh, Supreme Court decisions, uh, and also that you need to uh, have substantial um, process before any of your fundamental rights are removed. What was it that Mr. Rahimi had done or what was it that, um, uh, you know, separated him from his right to uh, bear arms? What you're saying is uh, he did something. Uh, how much did he know about it? Uh, what kind of due process was there? Again, as you say, in other rights, you get a huge uh, process before any such rights are removed. What was Mr. Rahimi's uh, experience? You know, I, it's important to point this out. We actually have no idea of what he did or didn't do. Um, he, he is alleged to engage in, have engaged in some act of domestic violence, but that was never proven um, because when um, his ex went to apply for a domestic violence protection order, um, he simply just conceded. He, he agreed to it. Um, and so it was issued on the basis of consent. He did not resist it. Um, and the record um, doesn't contain any findings um, in terms of what he did or didn't do. So we really don't know. And now, again, um, there's some very serious allegations about other things that he's done. So we can, I think, fairly surmise that he probably did engage in some act of domestic violence, but we don't know that for a fact. Um, what triggered his dispossession in this case was simply the issuance of that order. So he had an ex who went and applied for a domestic violence restraining order. He was given notice of the fact that the application had been filed in court. 
Um, by the way, the law does not require you to be notified that if the order is entered, you will no longer be able to possess firearms. And um, in many cases of prosecutions under this law, um, as we again pointed out in our amicus brief, people are often quite surprised to find out uh, that, that one of the effects of a domestic violence restraining order will be to dispossess them of their firearms. Uh, but that's all it takes. So, so just if, if one of these orders has been issued against you, whether you did anything or not, whether you um, could have uh, uh, opposed the motion, but you just kind of, you know, you went along with the application because your, your mindset was like, look, I, you know, I didn't do anything. Uh, and if the court wants to issue an order that says that I should continue not to do anything, fine. Um, I, I don't have any reason to go down in, into the courthouse and, and get in a big fight over that. So I'm not saying that that's what happened here. We don't know for sure what he did or didn't do. What we do know is that the way the federal law is written um, is that essentially any process will suffice as long as the, uh, the, the subject of the domestic violence restraining order is given notice that that application has been filed and that someone is seeking that order. That's really all it takes. And no matter kind of how slap and dash um, and sort of um, analytically sloppy the remainder of that process is, it doesn't matter. The Once the domestic violence uh, restraining order issues, the subject of that order is immediately uh, dispossessed. Or more precisely, in that moment, it becomes unlawful. It becomes a federal felony for that person to continue to possess a firearm. So whereas the headlines say a domestic abuser is, is, um, had his rights taken away, it's not been determined in any sort of legal process that he's a domestic abuser. It's just been a restraining order in which he said, OK, look, um, why fight it? I didn't do anything. Um, uh, but at no point, really, was he informed about what the, the implications of this of this determination. Um, so again, I'm getting back. Tell, again, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. As best we can tell, but again, the record is so sparse, we just don't know what happened for sure. So, so the police come in uh, on something else re unrelated. They find two weapons in his home, and they say, "Look, uh, these shouldn't be here because you don't have the right to own a weapon." Uh, I guess that may have been news to him, uh, but of course, now he's uh, in big trouble, uh, and he both, I guess, goes to court. Um, it was a public defender, I, I believe, and uh, asks to say, okay, look, how, how, how did this happen and how can I appeal it? Say more, okay, about the, the first steps of Mr. Rahimi's appeal against sort of having had it, this fundamental right taken away. Right. So that's all correct. So uh, Rahimi is prosecuted by the federal government for violating this federal law, uh, 922 G8, that makes it a crime to possess a firearm when you are subject to a domestic violence restraining order. He is represented by uh, federal public defenders um, in, in the Fort Worth area, um, who are very good. I, I've, I've been in touch with them. Uh, they filed an excellent brief. Uh, and they raised, as one of his defenses, the constitutionality, or more precisely, the unconstitutionality uh, of that law. Uh, and they argued that under the Supreme Court's most recent interpretation of the Second Amendment in the Bruin case that we discussed a moment ago that came down in June of 2022, the domestic violence restraining order part of 922G8 is unconstitutional because there's no historical analog to that law. And that's what the Bruin case, that's what's new about this Bruin case that came down last year, is that in order to, um, in effect, demonstrate the constitutionality of a law that has been challenged, the government has to identify um, some fairly analogous regulatory scheme, some fairly analogous law um, from the relevant time period. And the Supreme Court actually hasn't told us what the relevant time period is, but it looks like it's going to be either 1791, when the Bill of Rights was ratified, or 1868, when the 14th Amendment was ratified, um, which is the one that applies against states. Now, this is a Second Amendment case because it's a federal law. Second Amendment applies directly to the federal government. So most likely, the relevant time period is 1791. Um, and there really wasn't anything analogous to this. And if that matters, and that's going to be a big dispute between the government and Rahimi's lawyers, but if it matters, then uh, he's got the better of that argument. There is no analogous law from 1791 that looks anything remotely like this. Um, now, I have my own concern or I have my own uh, thoughts about whether the Supreme Court has got the analytical framework correct, but that's the analytical framework in Bruin. And if they apply it here, uh, this law could be in real trouble. So I can already hear uh, people listening to this podcast uh, objecting to uh, your assertion, which is, again, getting back to the Second Amendment itself. 
it may be an anachronistic. If we're looking for uh, analogous precedent, uh, laws that did take away people's rights for, let's say, domestic abuse, and we all know, unfortunately, again, this is not, we're not supportive of this notion, but uh, in the past, it wasn't the crime it is now to uh, abuse your spouse or, you know, whoever is in your life. Uh, that was perhaps a matter of course, whereas now we recognize it as a horrible, horrible crime. Uh, if we're appealing to history to look, show us the way here, and history didn't regard such abuse as, as a, a terrible thing, how can we reconcile this sort of appeal to the past? That's a great point. I think that really is one of the concerns of looking back um, to history. What, like, on one level, why would you look back at a time uh, when women were barely considered to be citizens at all? They certainly weren't considered to have all of the um, rights uh, of male citizens. Um, they were also um, very much sort of seen as uh, lesser people. Um, and uh, I think it's to some extent overstated how cavalier people were about domestic abuse during the founding. And there's actually a couple of really good amicus briefs that have been filed in Rahimi um, that, that try to make the point, actually, you know what, they took this more seriously back then than you might think. Um, but I think it's, it's undisputed or should be undisputed uh, that they were not as serious about things like domestic violence as we are. And of course, you know, this is a time when slavery was widely practiced, not only in America, but throughout the world. Um, and so it, it's self-evident that it's not the most enlightened uh, time. They were enlightened in some ways, but not in others. And so I think that's a genuine concern. Why would we go back and look at that uh, time in world history and say, okay, let's just update whatever their mindset was, and then that'll be the you know, that'll be sort of the framework that we apply today. So I think your question is well taken. Uh, on the other hand, that is the standard, that is the framework that the Supreme Court uh, has articulated. Uh, and you can, I mean, I, I've litigated cases um, in, in federal court for most of my career. And, you know, if your plan is to go into a court and say, I should win because the Supreme Court was wrong, well, good luck with that. <laughs> yeah. Well, again, so again, let's let's do that. Let's go there and say, okay, put on your other hat and 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 steel man on the other side, I guess. I don't know what the right term would be, but let's say we go in there and we know, let's say history isn't on, on our side and the Supreme Court uh, doesn't like to say it was wrong. Um, what would be the effective case that the federal government would make to say, look, uh, we don't want um, uh, spouses and, and partners to be abused, particularly with a gun. Uh, we ought not to arm uh, domestic abusers. What's their best case as you see it? Yeah, that's a great point. Great question. So the best case, I think, for the federal government in this um, Rahimi prosecution is to essentially um, say to take advantage of something that the Supreme Court said in Bruin that that the government can do in these cases, which to is engage in what's called analogical reasoning, which simply means you don't have to go back and find an exact duplicate of the law at issue today. You need to go back and find one that is sufficiently analogous. Um, and what the court said in Bruin, what the majority opinion said, is that with respect to problems that are somewhat novel, let's say, and you know, a great example would be hijacking an airplane, right? That's not something that would have been an issue in 1791, obviously. And so you don't have to have a really closely analogous law in order to uphold the federal ban on bringing a firearm onto an airplane. On the other hand, if the um, you know the problem at issue in the case was something that was known and being dealt with at the time, this, in this case, the time of the founding, then you the, there needs to be a much tighter relationship. In other words, the law that you go back and point to as being analogous from 1791 needs to look a lot like the current law. And I think that's um, the 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 major opportunity the government has here is to say, look. Um, yeah, they were aware of domestic violence back then, and to some extent they cared about it, but not really. And so we should be able to take advantage uh, of this um, approach where it's a, we, we can treat it as a relatively modern problem that would be you know, domestic violence in the sense that we've just recently gotten appropriately seriously serious about it, or maybe we haven't even yet, but we've gotten more serious about it. And what we do then is we don't have to go back and find a law that specifically disarmed uh, domestic abusers back in the late 18th century. We can just look at laws that disarm dangerous people, 
um, of various kinds. Um, and that was a concern they had back then. So we just update that and say, well, you know, he doesn't have to be dangerous in exactly the same way that they cared about back then, but they did care about disarming at least some dangerous people back then. And that's the relevant analogy, because guess what? We care about disarming dangerous people today. And we now realize in a way that perhaps they didn't back then that a domestic abuser is a genuinely dangerous person who really ought to be disarmed. That I think is the government's strongest case. Well, uh, again, I, I have a couple of concerns about that, which is when you use a term like dangerous, to me, it sounds like a slippery slope, uh, you know, from being a murderer is clearly a dangerous to someone who, let's say, jaywalks uh, might be dangerous to people as well. Uh, we don't want to be cavalier about taking away fundamental rights. But I want I don't want to dwell on that because the, the slippery slope is you know, there's no way to I, I'm sure you don't have a bright line there. Neither does anyone else. And that's my beef. Um, but what about the due process, right? You know, okay, like you've got the law. You, you, let's say domestic abusers ought not to have guns, but you know, he he didn't he didn't face a judge, he didn't face a jury, he wasn't even informed. It's it's like with a wave of a hand, his his fundamental right. I mean, that to me is as important as the the ability to take the right away with due process. With no due process, what the heck do we have, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. And that really was the focus of the um, uh, amicus brief that I drafted for Cato. And, and I, I think one way to maybe uh, help people appreciate just what an important concern this is, um, would be with the following illustration. You'd imagine a law, a federal law that says that anyone who has been accused of domestic violence on social media, Twitter, Instagram, whatever, uh, immediately loses their ability to own a gun. It becomes a crime from that point. Uh, I think almost anybody could look at that and say, well, wait a minute, that's 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 just an allegation. That's not a sufficient basis for uh, disarming somebody and making it a crime for them to own firearms. At the other end of the spectrum, you could have a federal law that says that anybody who has been convicted after a jury trial at which they were represented by counsel and received notice of all of the implications of what would happen if they were convicted, that person shall be dispossessed. Well, that's at the other end of the due process spectrum. And I can't imagine anybody you know, thinking, well, that's an insufficient amount of process, because guess what? That's all the process that we have to offer. Um, so then the question becomes, what about this actual law, the actual text of, of, of 922G8? Where does it fall on that spectrum? Is it closer to the anybody who's been, you know, accused of domestic violence loses their right to own a gun? Or is it closer to anybody who's been convicted after a jury trial at which they were represented at counsel, et cetera, et cetera? In my judgment, unfortunately, it's much closer to the first one. Um, and the process described in the federal law at issue in this case, uh, you know, the, the floor that it establishes for the amount of process that, that has to be built in um, to, 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 to the, um, the, the procedure by which a domestic violence restraining order is issued, it's really bare bones. And it allows people to be dispossessed after some of the most slap and dash, one-sided, non-reliable um, you know, processes that you can imagine, perhaps including the one at issue in this very case. And there's no real assurance that the person who you are now going to dispossess actually did anything wrong or represents any kind of a, a threat to the other person. Maybe they do, but maybe they don't. If we have real confidence about the, the probability that everybody who's subject to such an order really is a danger, we'd be having a whole different discussion, but not the way this law is written. It doesn't get the job done, in my judgment. So you've argued, you know, again, in front of the Supreme Court, now they're going to sit there and consider this, this case. It's a single case. And they've got a law that, as you say, really uh, is uh, doesn't offer much in the way of uh, precedence or uh, process uh, procedures. Um, so what is their choice? Is there, do they, uh, you know, a thumbs up or down, you know, when the decision, they say, okay, uh, you know, let's throw this out. Uh, the, you know, the headlines I'm sure we'll read, court believes domestic abusers should be well armed or something like this. Uh, but the reality, the sober analysis would be that, will the court, if it strikes this down or, or supports Mr. Rahimi, um, will that be an imperative then for the Congress then to write a better 922 G8 law that says, okay, you can lose, you know, domestic abusers can lose their right to bear arms, but there has to be sufficient process, and this is that process. Is that what, what we're looking at here? Well, we could be looking at a couple of things. So as we mentioned in our brief, this law was enacted, this law being 922G8, the Domestic Violence Restraining Order one, was enacted in 1994, uh, a full 14 years before anybody um, or before the Supreme Court held that the Second Amendment protects an individual right. So when Congress wrote this law, uh, the, the perception on the part of anybody who was, you know, staying current with 
with the court's Second Amendment jurisprudence is, in effect, there's nothing at stake here. Uh, the Supreme Court, well, the Supreme Court has not weighed in yet, and all of the lower courts have said the Second Amendment effectively doesn't mean anything. Um, and so, in a sense, this law was drafted by a legislative body that didn't think that it had to take at all seriously um, the the essence of the right at stake here, which is the right of somebody to, to, to own guns. And that really is reflected, I think, in the text um, of this provision. It looks like it was written by, by you know, a body that didn't think it had to really care too much or, or accord any significant weight to the right to keep bear arms. I think what could happen, we're looking at a kind of a potential fork here in terms of what the Supreme Court could do. On the one hand, what the court could do is it could say, well, um, you know, Mr. Rahimi has challenged this law facially. That means what he's argued is that this law is so badly written um, and it contains such uh, fundamental defects that it really can't be constitutionally applied to anybody and it has to be just struck down completely. Um, what the court could say essentially is, well, um, you are, we're not going to let you challenge the law kind of on behalf of everybody. We're just going to ask whether your constitutional rights were violated in the particular way that this law was applied to you. And what you did, sir, was you entered into an agreed um, protective order with your ex, which means that you, in effect, admitted that you were a bad guy or that you'd done some bad things. And you, you personally brought yourself within the ambit of this federal law through your own um, agreement not to uh, contest uh, the application for the domestic violence restraining order. So you brought this on yourself and your constitutional rights have not been violated. I wouldn't find that very satisfactory. I think that would be a little bit you know, uh, fast and loose, but I mean, the Supreme Court gets to do what the Supreme Court wants to do um, because they're the highest court in the land. Now, I think a more principled approach would be to say that the government in this case when they apply, this is called a cert petition, where you apply to have the Supreme Court review what the lower court did. In this case, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals struck down the law and said it was facially unconstitutional, can't be applied constitutionally to anybody. When the government took this case up to the U.S. Supreme Court, that's the way they wrote their cert petition. They, they said the question in this case is whether this law is facially unconstitutional. I think the court should take that at face value, so to speak, and say, yeah, that's the issue that's in front of us. This law uh, as you as you said, Joe, doesn't have a real historical analog, has very serious procedural due process problems. Oh, and guess what? We didn't talk about this yet. But also, it's not at all clear why um, regulating who can own a gun or, or specifically taking guns away from domestic violence um, uh, committers, people who allegedly committed domestic violence, why is that even any of the federal government's business? Federal government doesn't have any general police power. They only have the power to regulate commerce among the states and other enumerated powers, none of which plausibly relates to uh, protecting the interests of victims of domestic violence. As important as that is, it just isn't among the enumerated powers uh, of the federal government. So this uh, provision that's at issue in the Rahimi case uh, has just got a plethora of very serious constitutional problems. And I think if the Supreme Court approaches the case straight on and says, if the question is whether this law is facially unconstitutional, the answer is definitely yes. And Congress, guess what? Time to go back and rewrite it. There's a very important goal that you're trying to advance here. You've got to do it consistent with the Constitution. So try again. So essentially after uh, well Heller and then Bruin, we're living in a new world where this, the Second Amendment actually matters, that we have this right and you can't run roughshod over a fundamental right so that all those laws that sort of considered it, you know, dead letter uh, now must be rewritten to take more seriously this um, imperative to recognize a right and therefore be more more specific about the, the criteria uh, about uh, above which you would have to, you know, have your, your rights taken away, right? Essentially, this is a new world where old laws may not apply because they did not uh, contemplate the power of the Second Amendment. I think that's right. Um, not necessarily every law. Um, I, I think that there are some laws that that are uh, sort of stronger uh, for various reasons than others. But I'll just give you a couple of examples of ones that I think are going to be in real trouble. Um, and that is, um, there's another provision in the same statute that makes it a crime for an unlawful user of controlled substances um, to own a gun. Now, what does that mean? Who's an unlawful user and which controlled substances? The second question is easier because the, the we know from federal law what constitutes a controlled substance. But guess what? This includes marijuana. Half the states have legalized marijuana in some form or another, but it's still illegal under federal law. That means if you use marijuana, uh, it is technically illegal for you 
to own a gun. Now, you can drink all you want. That's fine. If your preferred intoxicant is alcohol, you're good to go. Uh, but if it happens to be a not particularly harmless plant with THC in it, then uh, you, it's illegal for you to own a gun. And then also there's another provision, the so-called felon in possession provision, which is a little bit of a misnomer. More precisely, um, the law says that anyone who has been convicted of a crime for which the punishment could have been more than one year um, is dispossessed for the rest of their life. Um, now, back in the founding era, felonies were serious, right? They were all serious. There were things like murder, arson, rape, mayhem, you know, uh, rebellion, treason. But we've so trivialized the concept of, of what it means to be a felony or to commit a crime for which the punishment could be more than a year. There's actually a case that has arrived at the Supreme Court. They haven't decided whether to take it or not, but it's out of Pennsylvania where some guy pled guilty to um, misrepresenting his income on an application for state food stamps in 1995. Um, his wife wrote their, uh, the, the uh, application for the food stamps and, and said that he wasn't earning any money and it turned out he was mowing some yards and he got convicted um, under uh, for a statute in Pennsylvania that was technically a misdemeanor, but the punishment was up to five years. So even though he got probation, his conviction triggered this federal law and he's dispossessed for the rest of his life. Now, the Third Circuit Court of Appeals sitting on bonk, that means the whole court said, nope, that is unconstitutional. Not the entire law, but the application of that law to this particular guy, his name is Range, R-A-N-G-E, is unconstitutional. And the U.S. government has asked the Supreme Court to review that case as well. So all of this is is on a direct path to the Supreme Court, and it'll be very interesting to see what they do, because there have been some extraordinarily unjust applications of these laws to people who are not plausibly any more dangerous than the rest of us. Yeah, it makes this case makes some strange bedfellows. I'm, uh, I don't want to bring up uh, current events, but clearly um, uh, the president is no friend of, of the Second Amendment, but his son effectively is in trouble for being a known drug user and applying for a gun. So he's run afoul of this law and is going to ironically make the case that uh, that you are making, which is, uh, you know, it's a fundamental right that uh, drug use may not forfeit that right. Uh, so again, this uh, will be thrilled to hear this again, and regardless of where you stand on, on your views on guns, um, this makes for an interesting intellectual debate. It, sort of, it allows us to analyze the essence of our constitution and the process and how we how we contemplate its 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 power over us and uh, which has lasted you know below these two hundred and seventy odd years. Um, so when does the uh, court hear the oral arguments? Maybe our listeners want to you know we now can actually follow those kinds of things. When when is that going to occur? So that'll be on November seventh. Uh, the Rahimi case will be argued at the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, it just so happens that I'll be there. Um, a colleague of mine, uh, Tommy Berry, who you know, yes. uh, is uh, going to be admitted to the Supreme Court that day. And one of the ways to do that is to have somebody who's already a member of the Supreme Court bar um, uh, formally uh, move your application. And you actually get to have a, a dialogue with the, the Chief Justice. And uh, so Tommy and I will be in court that day. And uh, I think it's, it's going to be a, a fascinating uh, argument because Again, um, you know, the, the optics and the facts cut one way, but then the constitutional arguments, I think, cut strongly the other way. And uh, it's a real um, a question, uh, sort of which which of those uh, will, will predominate. And I think we'll probably get a pretty good sense of that at the argument. That's wonderful. Do you have you, you have the little feather that you get when you argue before the uh, you, you got that on your your uh, bookcase? I, I do. It's not in my bookcase. Um, I'm, we're still working on the uh, office, as you can see behind me. But I do. I have uh, the quill. It's a you get actually um, an actual goose feather quill pen um, when you either argue um, or are you if you're sitting at counsel table for a, a Supreme Court uh, case. I was I was actually the the backup quarterback uh, for Heller, and so I got my quill from that. Um, little known fact, by the way, you get a special little index card um, that essentially becomes your pass to get into certain areas of the court um, when you're counsel uh, for a case that's being argued. And at the bottom of that card, there's a little note that says that everybody who, uh, every every bearer of this card is entitled to a free lunch in the court cafeteria after the argument. So I, I've never redeemed that myself, but uh, maybe maybe the next time. Wonderful. Who said, oh, that, that, that's a great, uh, great story. Uh, uh, makes it all worthwhile, that free lunch. Um, all the work, all the work that goes into it. So you and Tommy, again, he's a, Tommy Barry's a, a friend of this podcast. I'm, I'm thrilled that that should be great. So I'm sure you will both be writing a great deal leading up to the case and perhaps after the case, your impression of being there live, seeing the, 
you know, the the tension in the room. Uh, where can our listeners read your work and learn more? And e including your Miki brief, um, where can they find your work uh, at, at Cato? Yeah, so um, obviously Cato has a website. It's very simple, cato.org, C-A-T-O.org. Um, in terms of blog posts, uh, that's obviously uh, accessible from our homepage. But if you just type in Cato at Liberty, that brings up um, our blog. Um, and then if you're interested in any of our briefs, uh, that's pretty easy too. Just Google put Cato uh, plus any kind of a description. In this case, if you put Rahimi or domestic violence restraining order, amicus, um, another way to do it is to go on the Supreme Court's website. I think that's a great resource for people who are not familiar with it. Just, um, uh, you know, again, Google uh, U.S. Supreme Court. Their site has become very user friendly. And there's a page called Docket Search. And there's just a little box and you can put in the name of one of the parties. Uh, and you might have to click because that'll usually bring up a few different cases. Not Rahimi. That seems to be pretty unique. Um, but it's great. The Supreme Court has all of the uh, the briefs um, and orders uh, online. It's very user friendly, and I I love uh, just you know um, when a new case comes across my radar. A lot of the time, I'll go on the Supreme Court's website, look at uh, uh, you know the the cert petition, which is the the brief that's filed to ask the Supreme Court to take the case, and also look at some of the friend of the court briefs, which often provide some very interesting. Perspectives, you know, Joe, you mentioned how there's some interesting cross currents in this Rahimi case. Some of the most powerful briefs in the Rahimi case have been filed by public defenders um, whose politics are generally pretty to the left. Um, but what they know, and a lot of people don't fully appreciate, is that uh, the by and large, the people who get prosecuted for violating gun laws tend to be um, economically disadvantaged, black and brown, um, politically or otherwise, you know, sort of disenfranchised. So essentially people who don't have the ability to push back, they don't look like us by and large. Uh, and this is something that public defender groups have uh, a point that they've made with great power uh, to the Supreme Court to keep in mind that when you uphold a potentially unconstitutional law, uh, the effects of that law will not be visited upon all different demographics equally. Instead, that law will almost certainly be brought to bear uh, against uh, lower income uh, black and brown people. And if you think that the enforcement of drug laws is racially disparate, and trust me, it is, the enforcement of gun laws in this country is even worse. Um, and whether people think that's a concern or not, uh, you know, I, I understand that depends on a number of different perspectives, but it is a fact. And I think it's a fact um, that, that these groups have been very effective at bringing to the court's attention. I'm glad you connected our listeners to those good online resources to go to the primary source to use a high school term. You know, that's a primary source, not not hearing secondhand. Uh, the, the coverage of, of what goes on at the Supreme Court is so poor and it's no surprise to me that uh, folks have uh, ordinary folks have a, a dim view of the Supreme Court because they, they're seeing it through a lens uh, of, of people who really um, have an agenda. Um, and I think, you know, if you want to get inspired by what great minds are there on the court, what people, the great minds of people who are arguing in front of it, the, the you know, the in, intellectual and, and, and philosophical ideas that they wrestle with, you know, I find it inspirational. Uh, I hope our listeners do as well. So uh, we're running out of time. Uh, I appreciate uh, you being able to be with us here on Hub One Clark. You've been a great resource. Thank you for joining me. Well, it's been a real pleasure. Thanks so much for having me on. I'd love to uh, come back anytime, maybe uh, after the argument or once the Rahimi case comes down. I'm sure we'll have a whole lot more to talk about then. Indeed, I'll take you up on that. Thank you very much, Clark. This has been another episode of Hubwonk. If you enjoyed today's show, there are several ways to support Hubwonk and Pioneer Institute. It would be easier for you and better for us if you subscribe to Hubwonk on your iTunes podcatcher. It would make it easier for others to find Hubwonk if you offer a five-star rating or a favorable review. And we're always grateful if you share Habwonk with friends. If you have ideas or suggestions or comments for me regarding future episode topics, you're welcome to email me at hubwonk at pioneerinstitute.org. Please join me next week for a new episode of Habwonk.